Hi everyone, I'm Rob Adaran and in this talk we will discuss in a case-based manner how to treat DVT and PE and for how long. We have come a long way since warfarin, originally meant to be used as rat poison, has been introduced as an anticoagulant. We now have a lot of options. And we also know that over the course of someone's life, the risk for inherited factors and their relative contribution tends to diminish, whereas the contribution of acquired factors increases. There are numerous acquired factors that can increase the risk of venous thromboembolism and a patient may possess more than one. In the case of cancer, for example, the malignancy itself increases the risk. The insertion of intravenous ports can play a role as can certain agents used to treat the malignancy. And there are, of course, a whole host of other risk factors. The challenge when we're dealing with venous thromboembolism is that, of course, we're trying to counterbalance the two devils, thrombosis and bleeding. With anticoagulation, we have the risk of bleeding, which can be fatal. And with cessation of anticoagulation, we will have the risk of recurrent venous thromboembolism. Those advocating ongoing anticoagulation will show you diagrams such as this, 10-year follow-up data demonstrating recurrent venous thromboembolism rates, which are very high, particularly in idiopathic or unprovoked thromboembolism. Proponents of anticoagulation will also point to synechiae that form often after a DVT. These are permanent and these can act as a nidus for recurrent thromboembolism. On the other hand, bleeding can occur and it can be fatal. Major bleeding with anticoagulation can be in the order of 1 to 2 percent. Intracranial hemorrhage is possible and if there is a major bleed then the fatality from that can approach 20 percent. And by major bleed the definitions include requiring transfusion of at least two units, intracranial bleeding, retroperitoneal bleeding, spinal bleeding, and fatal bleeding. So to address all these various issues and scenarios, the CHEST guidelines have been released over the years with the most recent one, which is what this talk is about, being released in 2021. This talk then is not so much about what I think you should do, but rather what the CHEST guidelines recommend. And as with any clinical scenario, judgment and the unique aspects of the case have to be taken into consideration. So let's look at the first scenario. You have a patient with acute DVT. There is iliac vein extension. Do you administer A, anticoagulation, B, anticoagulation plus catheter-directed thrombolysis, or C, systemic lysis? And the correct answer in this setting per the CHEST 2021 guidelines are A. Anticoagulate only unless there is threatened limb. This, of course, is largely based on the findings of the large ATTRACT trial. Interestingly, the British National Institute for Clinical Excellence, or NICE, guidelines from 2020 recommend to perform CDT if there is low bleed risk, the patient has good functional status, and there is one year or greater life expectancy. The next scenario 
is in a patient with active cancer who develops venous thromboembolism. In this setting, do you initiate and maintain with A, enoxaparin, B, warfarin, or C, DOAC? And the new guidelines recommend DOAC over lower molecular weight heparins with a few caveats. For instance, in luminal GI malignancies, low molecular weight heparins or apixaban might be a better choice, and I will explain why in a moment. Now, an important thing that I'd like you to appreciate is that if a patient has active cancer, the studies show that the risk of venous thromboembolism or recurrent venous thromboembolism is greater, but so is the risk of major bleeding. Now, the past recommendations to utilize low molecular weight heparin in venous thromboembolism in the setting of cancer came from studies that were done mostly in the early 2000s, such as the 2003 CLOT trial and the 2005 LIGHT trial that demonstrated that compared to warfarin, low molecular weight heparins led to lower rates of recurrent venous thromboembolism without significantly different bleed rates. However, real life data shows that patients tend not to like to stay on low molecular weight heparins. The self-injection can be problematic. And in one study, at six months, only 37% were still utilizing them. More recent trials compared DOACs to low molecular weight heparins. And these showed that with DOACs, you had lower rates of venous thromboembolism, particularly rivaroxaban and apixaban. However, with upper GI and GU cancers, there was a greater rate of major bleeding with rivaroxaban and edoxaban. So the CHEST 2021 guidelines recommend that in venous thromboembolism and cancer, DOACs should be utilized over low molecular weight heparins, and if the patient has luminal GI cancer, low molecular weight heparins or apixaban would be the preferred agents. In the next scenario, what anticoagulation duration would you recommend in a patient with unprovoked venous thromboembolism? That includes DVT or PE. Is it A, three months, B, six months, or C, indefinite. And per the CHEST 2021 guidelines, the answer is C, indefinite. There have been a number of studies performed over the years that have demonstrated the benefit of extended anticoagulation after unprovoked DVT. I would like to show you one, the PADIS DVT study. The study took 104 patients who had received warfarin for six months. These patients were then randomized to continue warfarin or placebo for a further 18 months. Now bear in mind that like many studies where extended anticoagulation is evaluated, if the patient had a bleed in the initial treatment phase, they would be excluded from the study. Now what they found at the end of the 18 month extended period is that the group that received warfarin for the extended period had a recurrent venous thromboembolism rate of zero, whereas in the placebo group, there was an approximately 30% rate of recurrent DVT. There were no significant differences in major bleeding. The PADIS DVT trial further followed these patients for 24 months. Now, what's interesting is that if you look at time zero, this is after everyone has completed six months of warfarin, and the patients have been randomized to further warfarin for 18 months or placebo. And you can see that in the placebo group, the rates of recurrent venous thromboembolism start to rise and they approach around 30% at 18 months. Whereas the warfarin group is a flat line, it stays at zero till the 18 month mark. Now at the 18 month mark, 
the warfarin group also comes off the anticoagulation and the patients are followed and you can see that even in that group recurrent venous thromboembolism begins to take effect so much so that by the 42 month mark the group that had received the extended anticoagulation will catch up with the placebo group so this suggests and supports the notion that anticoagulation should be longer term in patients with unprovoked DVT. Now the same investigators also completed the PADIS PE trial in patients with unprovoked pulmonary embolism who either received six months of warfarin anticoagulation and then were randomized to placebo or they were randomized to 18 months of warfarin. And you can see that at the 18 month mark, as you would expect, there are much lower rates of recurrent, this is venous thromboembolism, so DVT and PE, in the warfarin group. But once the anticoagulation was stopped in the warfarin group also, there was a catch-up phenomenon. So moving on to the next scenario, you have a patient who completes three months of anticoagulant therapy for a DVT that was associated with orthopedic surgery. Do you now A. Stop the anticoagulant, B. Continue for another three months, then reassess, or C. Perform thrombophilia screening, then decide? And the correct answer per CHESS guidelines is A. Stop the anticoagulant because the um, trigger for the DVT, the provocative factor, is no longer present. Right, moving on to a scenario of pulmonary embolism. A 65-year-old admitted with acute chest pain and dyspnea. CTA reveals a left-sided pulmonary embolism. The patient's vitals are stable. Do you A, perform catheter lysis, B, systemic lysis, C, anticoagulation, or D, anticoagulation and further tests? And in this scenario, the correct answer would be D. The further tests would include cardiac enzymes as well as an echocardiogram. In this scenario, the patient remains stable, but the serum troponin comes back elevated at 2.5 and the echo reveals RV enlargement. So do you now continue anticoagulation? perform systemic lysis or continue anticoagulation and administer catheter directed therapy. And per the CHESS guidelines, the correct answer would be C, because this is a patient with intermediate risk pulmonary embolism. So you agree to bring the patient to the lab for catheter directed thrombolysis. But while waiting for the transport, the patient's blood pressure falls and stays at around 80 over 35. Do you now A. Continue CDT as planned, B. Perform systemic lysis, or C. Perform catheter-directed therapy plus systemic lysis? The correct answer per CHEST guidelines is B, because the patient now has high-risk pulmonary embolism and typically systemic lysis would be appropriate. Now there are scenarios in pulmonary embolism with shock where catheter-directed therapy might be appropriate, such as when the patient has high bleed risk, or failed lysis, or death is likely before the systemic lysis becomes effective, and in those settings catheter-directed thrombolysis would be reasonable but it is a weak recommendation. Right, moving on to the scenario of superficial thrombophlebitis. Do you recommend a warm compress, NSAIDs, and follow-up? Do you anticoagulate these patients, or does it depend? Well, the CHEST guidelines with weak recommendations suggest that you should consider anticoagulation if the thrombophlebitis involves the great saphenous vein, it's a large area, it is extending close to the saphenofemoral junction, if the patient has active cancer, it is severe, 
or there's a prior history of DVT or SVT. As you have seen, there are scenarios such as in the setting of unprovoked venous thromboembolism where extending anticoagulation is appropriate. But should you administer reduced dose anticoagulation? And this is in part to reduce bleed risk. And the CHEST 2021 guidelines suggest reduced dose anticoagulation and if done so with rivaroxaban 10 milligrams daily or apixaban 2.5 milligrams twice a day. However, this is a weak recommendation and the evidence has low certainty. Here I'm listing for you some very important takeaways from the CHEST 2021 guidelines. One is that the venous thromboembolism treatment phase is typically three months. This is if it's a DVT or a PE. For acute venous thromboembolism, the anticoagulant of choice is a DOAC. Bear in mind that when it comes to extended anticoagulation, while we might be talking forever, most of the data so far only goes out to four years. If a patient has an isolated distal left leg DVT, in other words, below the popliteal vein, then you could consider weekly imaging every two weeks over anticoagulation. In the setting of antiphospholipid syndrome and venous thromboembolism, warfarin is preferable therapy. This is particularly true in the so-called triple positive patients. In the setting of a venous thromboembolism and a transient risk factor, do not extend anticoagulation. And if you have completed anticoagulation and are stopping, consider maintaining the patient on aspirin. And to summarize the 2021 CHESS guidelines and wrap up, in the setting of provoked venous thromboembolism, administer three months of anticoagulation. In the setting of unprovoked venous thromboembolism, indefinite anticoagulation should be administered, but do follow bleed risk over time. And in the setting of venous thromboembolism and active cancer, DOACs are now recommended over low molecular weight heparins. Thank you for your attention.